Hey everybody, welcome again to our Versus Monday series. Uh, today I would like to talk about, again, dry suits, but from a little bit different perspective, because last month we have been talking about controlling buoyancy and dry suits, and we have discussed whether it's a good idea to control it with your BC or wing, or is it a good idea to control it only with your dry suit, and we came to a conclusion. And if you would like to know what we decided, just go back, watch the video from last month. But Today I would like to talk about uh, choice of dry suit because we did have a question from you which dry suit we would recommend as Jewy divers and which dry suit Jewy divers would use so what type of material mainly speaking we should be considering when we are choosing a dry suit for ourselves when we are talking about materials for dry suits we do have three main types you might have a uh, with the dry suit done from a neoprene, so the same material as a wetsuit, so they could be relatively thick, like five millimeters or seven millimeters. You can have dry suits done from something that we call a crushed or compressed neoprene, or you can have a dry suit that is done, generally speaking, from material that is called trilaminate, which is relatively thin compared to the other ones. So what I would like to talk now is to describe briefly those three types of materials, their advantages and disadvantages, and then in the end explain which of these materials do we would prefer for our divers to use and why. So the first I would like to discuss neoprene dry suits. And it's very hard for me to say neoprene dry suits because it's always neoprene wetsuit that comes to my mouth, but we are talking about dry suits now. So dry suits done from neoprene are quite popular in certain areas or certain group of divers because most probably they are relatively cheap and accessible. The problem with, uh, or not the problem, one of the advantages of a dry suit that is done from neoprene that is really warm as it is. So you would not need to have a lot of undergarment because the dry suit itself will provide some insulation because the neoprene will be thick. So it will be a little bit like your wetsuit and additionally to that, you will have the gas that is uh, put inside to keep you insulated from the water as well. And in that case, you would wear relatively thin undergarment because you don't need a lot because the material itself has some insulation properties. It is as well relatively easy to fix because, or first, it's relatively hard to break because the material is thick. But then if it's cut or if it's, you know, and there is a, it's a tear in it, you can fix it relatively easy in a similar way that you will fix a wetsuit with a glue and you know, a patch, so it's relatively easy. The thing that is not really very good with those is that for traveling, they are not really very convenient because they are relatively heavy. They are really bulky because it's a lot of these suits. It's much bigger than a neoprene wetsuit, so it will be very hard to pack it in a way that you can fly with it, for instance. And it's quite, it takes quite a lot of time for it to dry because of the material that's being used. And of course, one of the biggest disadvantages for a neoprene dry suit from our GUE perspective is its buoyancy. Because as a wetsuit has a positive buoyancy on the surface that you need to compensate with weights, a dry suit will have the same, but with dry suit it will be even harder or even more weight because most of the time the dry suit will be bigger because then you will still be needing to put some undergarment under it and it's not fitting so snugly as a wetsuit. So a no print dry suit would require even more weights compared to a wetsuit. The second type of material that you might see, which is not really very popular because those suits are uh, a little bit more expensive, are suits done from a material that is as well a no print but is crushed or it's compressed already. So the material is produced from a normal neoprene, but it's put under pressure for a prolonged period of time and the suit uh, and, the, and the material is being compressed. So in this way, then this material is used to produce a dry suit. So those dry suits are having some very good features because they are warm as they are as well, because they do have this insulation layer, which is still relatively thick. They are very robust. It's really impossible almost to destroy those suits because the material is so robust and it's so strong. If they do get 
broken, if you have a tear or anything, it's very easy to fix as well, similarly to a neoprene dry suit or a neoprene wetsuit. Uh, the other thing they do have as a positive is that the buoyancy uh, characteristics are not so big as a uh, neoprene dry suit, which means it's already compressed. So you will not need to take so much weight compared to a neoprene, like a proper neoprene dry suit. But this compression makes the material very stiff, uh, very heavy. It takes longer time for it to dry and it's quite hard to travel with those because they're as well relatively stiff. So folding them nicely into a small packet is really quite hard. So they have been popular and they are still quite popular in certain areas, especially if you need very robust suits where you are potentially having areas that you can cut a delicate material like inside racks. Though I would always say if you have good buoyancy, you know, cutting a dry suit it's a rare occasion, but still. So the second material is crushed or compressed neoprene. And the third type of material that many people use, and if you look at Jewy divers, most of the Jewy divers would use, is a trilaminate, which is a very thin material. It looks a little bit like actual fabric, and the name comes from three different layers that that fabric has, of which one, most of the time, is the one that actually insulates you from water. So this is the waterproof barrier that it has. And normally it has like two layers inside and outside. It could be nylon, it could be cordura. So depending on the materials that are used in this trilaminate, you might have a little bit more variety. But most of the time the trilaminate suits are very light. They are very easy to wear because if you would compare wearing a um, crushed or compressed neoprene dry suit to wearing a trilaminate dry suit, which is done from, some of the layers are done from nylon, which is, in that case, the dry suit is very, very light. It's like wearing a very heavy coat with winter or even two or three coats in winter compared to wearing, you know, a very nice silky shirt in the summer. Because the difference on, in comfort is quite big in regards of how do you feel the dry suit on your body. So the trilaminate is very light. It allows, because of this lightness, for much more uh, maneuverability. So you can move much more freer. You don't feel, most of the time, if you're not squeezing your dry suit and you have enough gas in it, that you don't have it on because it's so thin. Uh, the other thing is that these materials dry very quickly. And of course, a dry suit will always have some components that are done from a different fabric, like pockets or boots, and they will dry longer. But if you have a trilaminate dry suit, it in a nice ventilated area, it can be dry within an hour. So it's perfect for traveling because of the softness of the material, you can fold it nicely in a small pocket. And if I'm traveling with my dry suit, I fit my dry suit, my undergarment, all my basic gear into one bag, which is really very convenient when you are traveling. But of course, because of the material is being so soft or it's being so uh, thin, it is quite easy to damage. So very often these suits might be punctured, even if you are folding them incorrectly, or if you are putting heavier equipment on top of it and then putting it together, for instance, when you park for traveling. So you would need to have a little bit more attention to detail and care for the dry suit. It is relatively easy to fix if it's a puncture because you can use a aqua seal glue or you can use tape that mm, you can put over it and then it seals the tear temporarily. So they are relatively easy to uh, repair, but sometimes with time, that material might become delaminated or the material will become in itself used enough that the water will just perforate through it. So the trilaminate suits, they have a lot of advantages. Most of the Jewy divers will use those materials because they are so light, so easy to use, but it comes with this Delicacy. I mean, they are just too fragile sometimes for certain environments and some divers would prefer the crushed neoprene or the pre-compressed neoprene, even if they are heavier. So for instance, if you are diving in UK or if you are diving in Norway and you don't travel a lot, you might go for a crushed or compressed neoprene dry suit, even if it's heavy, because it will not be an issue. But if you are a traveling diver, or if you are a traveling instructor, you would prefer to have something that it's light and then you can fold it into a small small packet and then just put it into your suitcase on your bag. 
So as with everything, pros and cons, but now I would like to talk about the main reason why Dewey divers are not using neoprene wetsuits, uh, sorry, wetsuit, no, but neoprene dry suits and would prefer to have a trilaminate dry suit. Let's talk now about the main issue that we as Dewey divers have with uh, neoprene dry suits or even wetsuits because it's a similar problem that we have. And it's not that it's not allowed to dive in a wetsuit or it's something wrong with them, it's just to understanding on a certain concept that is really very important, not only from the comfort perspective, but as well safety. So what I'm talking here about now, I would like to introduce a concept of something that we call a balanced rig, where a rig means the whole set of the equipment that you have on you as a diver, and a balanced rig would be a set of gear, this would include as well wetsuit or a dry suit, that would allow you to ascend relatively comfortably in an emergency situation which is where your wing gets incapacitated in a way that it cannot hold gas. So basically you are at the deepest phase of your dive with a wing that doesn't hold the gas that you need to stay there, neutrally buoyant, and you need to thin up to the surface. And we would call a balance trick a set of equipment that would allow for that situation. So, in other words, this set of equipment cannot be too negatively buoyant because otherwise you might not have the strength, the ability, the skill, the power to swim up from 30 meters or deeper, depending on what type of diver you are and then how deep you are going. So now, if we reverse to the beginning, so if you're on the surface and if you are wearing a wetsuit or if you are wearing a neoprene dry suit because it's almost the same and a dry suit is a little bit worse in that scenario because it's more neoprene because the dry suit has, is bigger, generally speaking, even for the same person. What you need to do in the beginning of your dive to compensate that positive buoyancy that the neoprene gives you, you need to put weight on. So this is this weight belt, tail weight, any weight that you are taking is most of the time to offset the positive buoyancy of the neoprene that you have on you. So this is the thing that you need on the surface. The moment when you start to sink down, what happens with the neoprene, it compresses because the gas that is inside it will compress. And as you go deeper, the more negative will become because the neoprene is getting compressed. So what we are doing there, if you start to sink, we are compensating that compression by adding gas to your wing, to your jacket. And this is called buoyancy control on a descent. And then where you're arriving at the bottom, you equalize your buoyancy. So whatever got compressed on your wetsuit or on a neoprene dry suit, you just add it to your wing. Plus, you need to compensate as well for the weight that you are carrying, that you need it on the surface, but actually you don't need a depth because the wetsuit is already compressed. So now you have quite a lot of gas in your wing. So now if this wing fails and the gas escapes, you need to thin up to get safely to the surface even if there is a team to help you thin, there will be kind of an effort to get up to the surface. So now the question is, you should have your equipment configured in a way that it would allow you to come up. And with a wetsuit or a neoprene dry suit, it will be extremely hard to do so. Because very often those suits, wetsuits, especially thick wetsuits, like seven millimeter wetsuits, and neoprene dry suits, which are very often done from five or seven millimeter neoprene, will require a lot of weight on the surface to go down. And with a dry suit, it's even a bit worse because additionally, you will have all of the gas traps in, trapped in your dry suit because of its shape and it's more complex. It has arms and legs. The gas can get trapped in the folds of the material because it's as well stiff, so it's not so easy to vent that gas. You will have additionally an undergarment that will trap some gas, so compared to a wetsuit, with a neoprene dry suit, you will have even more weight. So then this compensation where you go down, this compression, will be even bigger, so you will have even more gas in your wing. So if it fails, it is even more problematic, because most of the time, the wing that you carry is too small to keep you neutrally buoyant at this depth, not even speaking about being able to swim up. So very often, if we have a combination of a very thick neoprene dry suit or 
neoprene wetsuit, to be honest, you will have the problem that that configuration of equipment is not balanced. And in case of an emergency at depth, where everything is compressed, but you still carry the weight that you need it to go down, the wing fails, or it potentially even do not have enough volume to keep you at depth, and you will either keep on sinking or really fighting to come back to the surface. And as you know, when you are exerting a lot underwater, you will produce a lot of CO2, which makes the exertion even bigger. You will start to have problems breathing. You will have the urge to breathe even more. And then in the end, it might evolve into panic, which is not really a very good thing to have, additionally to the problem that you have already with the failed wing. So this problem, so the problem of the gear that contains with it a neoprene dry suit or a very thick neoprene wet suit is not really very, it's not even popular. It's not, I cannot say it's not allowed, but it's not really very smart to have. So most of the Jewy divers will not go for that solution at all because they are aware about this risk. And if I can mitigate that risk by choosing my equipment properly and one of them to reduce the amount of weight that I need to carry because of offsetting positive buoyancy of equipment that I have on the surface, the better it is for me. That's why we would always choose a trilaminate dry suit, which does not have any buoyancy properties in itself because the material doesn't change. So the only thing that you will need to control is the amount of gas that you put in your suit. And as we have discussed in the video a month ago, you will see that this normally would be adding just a little bit of gas to your dry suit. So the volume of gas that you carry will be little. So you will be properly weighted, your equipment will be balanced, and in the end you will not have problems, potentially, at depth if the wing would fail. And this can happen. And as GUE, you know that we always are trying to prevent risk and understand what can potentially go wrong. And if there is a solution, a smart solution, a good solution that will actually be practical to use there, to help me out of the situation. I hope that with this video I explain a little bit the reasons why Jewy divers would prefer and would almost always prefer a trilaminate dry suit, even if they are more fragile, they are a little bit more prone to being broken and punctured, compared to more robust but neoprene suits. And the main reason is how this suit behaves underwater in regards of changed buoyancy parameters so they are not extremely buoyant on the surface because they are not the material itself doesn't change its buoyancy compared to a neoprene dry suits or wetsuits in the matter as well so i hope it answered some of the questions why jury divers are preferring one type of a dry suit over the other as usual if you have any questions or if you'd like to know more i invite you to go to check some videos on GWTV. tv you can always post your questions here below in the comments and we will try to answer as quickly as we can. And in the meantime, thank you for listening and I will see you on the next episode of our Versus Monday.